My name is Paul Bashir. I am co-founder and director of Anonymous for the Voiceless. And to my left, I have my partner, Asal, and she is also co-founder and director of Anonymous for the Voiceless. <laughs> I just remembered that from the conference. <laughs> Thank you all for that warm welcome. And so we're just hanging out at this point and asking questions and discussing some important topics. Do we have anybody else expected, do you think, Joanna? Um, it seems like we can begin. Yeah, we'll get started? Yeah. Alright, cool. Um, does anybody have any questions before we do get started, actually? No? Okay, cool. Well, first, what we're going to do is discuss what we do on the streets, which is called the Cube of Truth, right? Some of you don't know what that is, so we'll discuss what that entails. Uh, then we'll talk about outreach, and that's where we'll focus this night. We're going to focus on outreach. Outreach can just mean how to talk to non-vegans about veganism. So we're going to discuss that, the most effective ways to do that. And then I'm going to do something called an objection handling workshop, where you guys throw all of your non-vegan objections at me, mm -hmm. that you find the most challenging that you have to deal with. God says it's okay, plants have feelings too. Our ancestors ate meat, etc. And I'll respond to them one by one. We will respond to them one by one and help you with those challenges that you're having. Sound like fun? Yeah. <laughs> uh, cool. So first we'll start with AV and we'll introduce you to AV. So did you want to do that? So we started in April 2016 in Melbourne, Australia, so just over two years ago we started. And at the moment we have about 650 chapters around the world, and we've held about um, 4,000 events. And for those of you who are familiar with the tally that we keep at the events, that's a tally of people who take veganism seriously after having a conversation with us. So we have convinced about 150,000 people so far to take veganism seriously. So we're just going to get into the structure of the cubes and then we'll talk about the outreach. Um, so basically what we do, we form a cube with activists wearing the anonymous mask or the Guy Fawkes mask. Um, the cube can be anything from four people, so one on each side, to two to three. Um, and if you're standing in the cube, we ask you to stand straight and don't look around. Stand shoulder to shoulder to the person next to you. If you're holding a screen or a sign, just try to hold it, hold it as straight as possible, especially if they're taking photos. They might come around and straighten your sign or screen. Um, don't look at your phone or don't look around, don't talk to the activists around you. And if you ever need to take a break, you're more than welcome to take a break. You just put your hand up and one of the organizers will come and get someone to swap with you. Um, also, if you're standing in the cube and you see a very young child watching the footage unsupervised, raise your hand again so that one of the organizers can come and find out if that child is with their parents or not. Um, another occasion you would raise your hand is if you feel like there's a bystander who's been standing there watching the footage and no one has talked to them yet. So you raise your hand so that one of the outreachers will go and talk to them, but you need to do that in a way that that person doesn't realize that you've asked someone to go and talk to them, because otherwise they might just feel a bit scared and yeah, they might just start walking. Point. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, don't, don't point to them, maybe just say, you know, that person standing there with a red jacket, just go and talk to them, they've been standing there for 10 minutes. Um, and we do suggest that if you're in a queue, take breaks regularly, because it is very exhausting. So every hour or so you can swap with someone. It's very important for everyone to be in the queue. A lot of people think that they're really good on outreach, and a lot of you guys are, but 
It's also very important to participate in the actual queue. It's very powerful. It's a really great experience when you're wearing the mask and you look at people's reactions and you listen to the conversations. Also, we need to remember that if it wasn't for the queue, we wouldn't have a demonstration. So it's not like the outreach is the more important part of the demonstration. They're both equally important. Um, so we do recommend that everyone gets in the cube unless you have a medical condition that you can't be standing in the cube for a long time, which is understandable. But other than that, everyone should get in the cube and then you can experience both the cube and then you can do outreach. <coughs> Um, if you're coming to the queue, we ask that you wear black. If you don't have an AV top, just any top that's black. Or if you don't have anything black, a dark color. Um, if you can wear all black, that's really great. And also, if you bring a bag with you, just try to bring a small bag that you can wear. Because uh, usually there's no space that we can have the bags. And it will be your responsibility if it gets stolen. So we ask that people don't bring big backpacks that is heavy. Um, so just bring a light bag and wear it, whether you're in a cube or you're on outreach. Um, I did mention the three occasions that you raise your hand. So again, if you, if you need anything for any reason, just raise your hand. That's your way of communicating with the organizers. Um, if the public approaches you and they're talking to you, you don't need to be talking to them. You can point to one of the organizers. Um, if someone puts their hand on you or do anything crazy, again, put, put your hand up so that one of the organizers can go and talk to them. Um, that's basically the cue. Did I miss anything? So that's basically the cube aspect. Does anyone have any questions about the cube aspect of the demo? Yes. I, I actually have a few questions. Um, one of uh, the biggest things that I run into um, where we do outreach, or where we do the cube, I sometimes have a hard time distinguishing who is part of the cube and who is, you know, stopping the watch. Um, because, you know, they're, you know, a lot of people have their activist shirts or they have, you know, other um, shirts that identify that some people don't. And so it's hard to tell. And also, language barriers. It's hard to know in our group who speaks what language or if anybody speaks more than just English. So if we need, you know, and especially like maybe someone to sign, you know, if there is, you know. So to respond to your first question, um, if you're doing outreach and you're not sure, whether someone is a part of the demo or not, I guess you just need to ask them. It's happened to myself before when I start a conversation, I approach someone and I say, have you seen this kind of footage before? And they say, I'm actually vegan, I'm volunteering. <laughs> so you, you just have to ask them. But um, when we do the briefing at the start of the demo, we usually ask if anyone speaks any other language. So if there is someone who speaks Spanish, for example, then everyone should know that that person speaks Spanish. So if you get a Spanish-speaking bystander, then you can go and get that person. Um, but other than that, yeah, there's nothing we can do. Um, in the chapter in San Diego, which is all wear bandanas, black and white yeah. bandanas around her neck, so that way you can tell. You mean all the volunteers? Yeah, just around the neck. And then you can just tell because a lot of people wear all black. Yeah. So you can't really tell, but everyone around, like, just black and white, in the same one. So it looks very. Yeah, just something to identify so you know that you're all part of the same group. Some of our chapters have um, lanyards that they wear with a name tag and with the AV logo, so that's what they do. So it's really up to the organizers if they want to have something like that. The mask also, if you wear the mask when you're around, sometimes mm -hmm. that's quite helpful. I was about to mention yeah. that. Yeah, but we, if you're in the cube and you take a break, you're doing outreach, you can still wear your mask here so that everyone else knows that you are from the demo. I think we've grown to quite like that look as well. It looks really oh. cool. <laughs> uh, another benefit of having the masks on the shoulder means that you're not sharing masks. Um, yeah, so it's... It's more hygienic. Yeah. I the 
events in London and people were pretty grossed out of sharing the masks, so we yeah. more so that everyone had one each. Yep. Um, and also, being in London, we struggle a lot with who speaks what language, so what we're going to do is get lanyards with the nationalities flagged. Yeah, that's a great Incredible. Idea. So we're working on it. Yeah. <laughs> I've had people approach me because I'm wearing the mask on my arm. Some people approach me and ask questions too. Yeah, there you go, because they know that you're part of the group. Yeah. Yeah. It looks more professional too, like we're all together. It shows, uh, it actually would be easier for the organizers to count the attendee numbers as well yeah. if you wanted to count how many volunteers showed up. So there's many benefits for us to implement that, so yeah. It's nice that they could sell the masks and the uh, t shirts both at the events so that when we get there we could actually just buy it. We can't do that. Can. No, because if we start setting up stalls that sell clothing, we need like permits and costs go along with that and uh, you need insurance and other things. Unless so. we do it in a way like if people order beforehand and they have it there and the payment can be done online. But that's something to discuss with the organizers. Yeah, because usually the, well, the way they think, the way that... Over <laughs> here, it keeps going out. The way that it's set up... <laughs> so we're talking into it now. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the way that it's set up at the moment is... I actually just forgot my train of thought. What were we talking about? <laughs> the masks, the white masks. Oh, yeah. So every city, every chapter organizes like a bulk order for their volunteers at some point. And then you, there's a discount that comes along with doing bulk, bulk orders through our store. So that's another. That's kind of how that works at the moment. So we could buy in theory from the organizer then? You could organize with your organizer and the whole group. Oh, to do a bulk order of how many people want AB shirts? 20 people? Cool, we'll do 20 orders. Can we get this fixed? Because I don't feel like this is... Is it? Oh, okay, cool. All right, so any other questions regarding the queue? Yep. So you guys said uh, 150,000 people and roughly uh, have moved to be curious about veganism. What is the how do you guys gauge that? So how do we define it? Yeah. Uh, okay, so as you know, when you're doing street activism, there's no way that you can define exactly, like, you, there's no way you can say definitively that somebody has gone vegan, even if they say that they're going vegan to you. The only way to fully know is if you hire a private investigator to follow up <laughs> on their lives. So since you can't achieve that, then the best thing that we have is to go on our sincere feeling of whether they are going to go vegan or not. So we count this as somebody who doesn't just make a couple of compassionate comments about animals, nod their head while they're talking to you, and then take a card and leave. We're talking about people who have shown you clearly that they take this issue seriously and that they want to move in the direction of becoming vegan. And then when you give them the information, they show interest in actually following up and looking at whether it's a documentary or going and signing up to Challenge 22, which is a 22-day vegan support group that they can sign, anyone can sign up to for free. So, and you can also gauge by asking them, do you think you'll be going vegan after this experience you've had with us? You can, you know, you can prompt them with that question as well. So we, that's how we gauge. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, so that's the best that we can do, and yeah, that's that's where our talent comes from. If it seems unclear, I said me from my opinion, if it seems unclear to anybody, I think it would clarify through your experience. Like, the more you do it, the more you'll see yes. exactly Good what point. I mean. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it might seem kind of unclear now and vague, but the more people you talk to, you can easily say, you know, yeah. from like a scale of zero to ten. Yeah. So. Yeah. I also just want to use this opportunity to talk about the 100 point system. So our goal on the streets is not necessarily, and this is perhaps what should be everyone's goal in general, is not necessarily to get someone to go vegan there and there on the spot during that conversation that you're having with them. We only have a short amount of time with people on the streets doing this work. So our goal is to push people up on the 100 point system. Most people are against animal cruelty. It doesn't sit well with them. So right off the bat, you could say that many people are, are not even at the zero point. They're, they're somewhere above zero. But if you're talking to a cow farmer, they might be in the negatives. Who knows? But my point is, 
you're supposed to think of this as a 100 point system where you work your way up the system. So, what am I trying to say? I'm saying that if you talk to somebody about veganism and you make really, really rational points that cause them to think about this seriously, that's 50 points perhaps, maybe higher. Okay? Then they go home and they watch a documentary as a result of that conversation, that's 20 points, you've got them up to 70. Then they go to a vegan restaurant the next day and they try a really bomb vegan meal. That's another 10 points, that now they're up to 80. Then they read something that's really shocking about the environmental aspects. That's another 10 points. Then they find out that they can actually reverse heart disease and cancer by going on a plant-based diet, 100 points. They're sold. They just needed that benefit at the end to push them over the edge. That's how the system works, so don't get frustrated when somebody doesn't, the penny doesn't drop right there and then in front of you and they don't go vegan on the spot. It's not how it worked for me. I needed education and independent research that I did on my own. That's what took me, that's what got me to where I am today. I'm sure many people did go vegan overnight. Many have, but many, have, many, many more have not. And so we have to think of it more as getting them closer to veganism. That's the way that we should be looking at this. If somebody goes vegan on the spot, that, that is also our goal. <laughs> like, we're not going to be upset with that, right? But that's not necessarily, like, we don't want to be attached to that because we're all going to drive ourselves insane if we do that. That's, that's why we are we, you know, working on a 100 point system. So with outreach, um, as Asal's already covered, we allow people to come to us. So that's very important. Oh, okay, cool. So I'll get into the outreach now. So with the outreach, the cubes, let's just say the cubes operating as proficient, as effective, as efficient, as amazing as possible. Okay, the cube is operating and functioning perfectly. Then you have the outreach team. What the outreach team do is we're standing by for, ban for bystanders to stop and we engage with them. So we only engage with people who stop and if I had to put a time frame on it, it would be 30 seconds to a minute. But I don't necessarily, we don't, as an organization, we don't officially have a time frame for this because you're supposed to use your best discretion. But I will say, please don't move in too quickly to talk to people. That's the number one problem we find on outreach around the world is that people move in too quickly. They get too excited. Oh my God, somebody's stopped and somebody's watching. I'm going to go have a conversation with them right now before they leave. You will push people away psychologically at least. And that's not what, what, that's not what you want. When you engage in discussion with people, you want them to be engaged in the conversation, listening to what you have to say, and most importantly, being intellectually honest with you, which will not happen if someone has their, has their walls up. If someone's on the defense, they will not be intellectually honest with you. They'll tell you plants have feelings, even though they don't believe that. So. It's important that we play this from a sales psychology point of view. We allow people to stop, watch the footage, there we go, and absorb what they're watching on their own accord. Because nobody in this room likes somebody else to make their mind up for them. Am I right? You like to make up your own mind. So people stop, they watch the footage. Uh, then, we ask, then we would go over to them and ask them really simple questions. So we just start off by being normal human beings and people say, what should I say to people? What, what, give me some lines to use. I'll say, I'll give you one, hi. <laughs> start your conversation like that and see where it takes you. <laughs> so be a normal person. I recommend that highly. <laughs> then say, have you ever seen this footage before? That's probably the most common question you'll hear at an AV demo. Have you ever seen this footage before? Uh, my favorite question is, would you like to know why we're here? Because it plays into the curiosity of what they're thinking. They show up, they see a bunch of people dressed in black with masks, holding true signs and laptops, playing horrendous footage of animal cruelty. What the hell is going on right now? That's what I'm imagining people are thinking. So would you like to know why we're here? Yes, I would like to know. Great. So then I would get into more questions because Questions are more effective in this line of work than statements. And I'll give you an example. I could walk up to you and say, animal exploitation is wrong. Okay? Where does that leave you in the conversation? Okay. Nowhere. You just, it's, I'm just shooting words at you. If I say, do you think animal exploitation is wrong? You now have a position in this conversation. 
So he now gets to answer the question. Well, I, well let me think about it. Mm, animal exploitation is wrong, actually. It doesn't sit right with me. That's what you want, engagement. People engaging in conversation with you, not you just having a conversation with them. I will say, though, lecturing, you know, dropping truth bomb after truth bomb after truth bomb on people, that has its place, okay? And it's usually during conversation that you'll realize that someone is in a position to receive that. So you have to engage in conversation first to find where people are at and whether they are willing to just sit there and withstand truth bomb after truth bomb. Because usually not everybody's open up to that, right? They're usually not willing to do that. They want to just be asked questions, have things to think for themselves, get the information, do their own research. So you want to be asking questions, right? So I think you guys got the point with that. And essentially it's more effective because, um, again, when you do find that point where people do want to receive lots of information, then you can just go, you know, go AWOL on dropping information. And it's a great opportunity uh, when, when you do have one, but for the most part, people do like questions. So we're going to ask a serious questions about the footage that they're watching. Another question I like to ask people is, did you know that what you're watching is RSPCA approved, or in this country it's SPCA, isn't it? So you could say, did you know that what you're watching is SPCA approved? It's also, it's also organic, free range, cage free, humane certified. This is standard practice. So. Ask them the question, did you know that? Because most people will be shocked by that. Most people that see us on the streets take away the message without talking to us uh, that we are against animal cruelty, but they don't necessarily know what the solution is to that. So they might, people might be thinking that the solution to that is better conditions for the animals. Therefore, it's very important that you make the distinction very quickly that what they are watching right now is considered the most humane, highest standards within animal agriculture. So we start off with the animals that people eat and use for food because most people are exploiting animals in that way. At least 98% of the animal cruelty that exists, that exists in this world comes down to food products. And so we focus on that first, but then during the conversation, it will probably come up that, well, objections will probably come up during these discovery questions that you have. People might say, well, yeah, I do think that animal exploitation is wrong, but God put animals here for us to use. You know, so there might be an objection that comes along. And that's what I'm going to help you with during this outreach workshop. But is there anything else that I have to cover before I get into that? Uh, just um, if you are having a conversation with someone, if you're doing outreach and um, you feel like they're just there to troll and argue with you or that you've been spending quite a lot of time, say over half an hour and that conversation is not going anywhere, it's better to walk away from that conversation. So I guess the more you do outreach, you learn better how to recognize whether that person is actually interested or not and it's very important to walk away from them you can leave them a card and you can say i'm not here to argue with you um but definitely walk away because there are so many people out there that are open-minded and they want to learn about this so we want to focus on those people and we don't want to waste our time with people who just want to argue with us can we just hold questions but can you just Write that question down so you don't forget it. Um, but I think that's it in terms of outreach. Yeah, so. And also just the tally. So if you're doing outreach, we do keep a tally. So um, Paul explained before what kind of conversations we count as a tally. Mm -hmm. So make sure you, if you can remember the number or if you want to write it down on your phone or if you have a clicker. Just make sure that at the end of the demo, you give that number to your organizer so they can count it as a total tally. But again, it's very important for us to be conservative about our tally. It's not really a competition. We all feel good if we got 10 people, but we, we do want us to be conservative. So please just remember that. I, I also want to say, even if you get zero while you're out doing cubes with us, you still play an integral role in the success of the event because without you being there, it may not have been as effective as a whole, which we're all part of. So I'm gonna give you guys some 
things to remember here with regards to outreach. Now, when AV was... Um, during AV's inception, I realised that outreach had a lot to do with sales. And... Has my mic played up again? Nothing. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you can hear what I can hear. Um, so... So I'm going to give you some things to, to consider here, because I have a strong sales background. That's what I did for a paycheck before I was even thinking about anything to do with plant-based eating or ve I wasn't even, I didn't even know what veganism meant until my early to mid-twenties. That's how new I am to all, all of this. But anyway, I realized that my sales experience aligned perfectly with what outreach was all about and then I started talking about it in this kind of a way and now sales has been in the conversation where it come when it comes to outreach more and more in this movement and I'm really happy to see that because most people uh, a lot of people in the vegan movement I won't say most people a lot of people have done sales at some time or another they've had a sales job and they've been through sales training so you might have learned skills in those in those training sessions that I think that we should remember and use when doing outreach because convincing somebody to go vegan is indeed a sales process. Okay, you have very you have it's very much the same. So objections are objection handling is a term that comes from the sales world. By, sales world, by the way. So an objection is somebody saying plants though. And the way that we would identify that is actually a point of inquiry. If it's coming from someone who's being genuine with you and not just trolling. So that's important. Like Asal said, it's important for us to distinguish whether these people are just wasting our time and to just cut conversations short with people who are unreachable. But if somebody's being genuine with you and saying, but don't plants have feelings as well, or whatever the argument might be, we should view that as a point of inquiry. There's work to be done. They're obviously interested, but in their minds they see an obstacle and they don't even understand perhaps why that obstacle is there, so let's help them through it. So sales is really the backbone to succeeding in outreach. That's what I want to say and I'll give you guys some tools. So the first thing I want to discuss with you guys is the feel, felt, found uh, method. Feel, felt, found. Okay? You guys might want to write this stuff down, feel, felt, found, and the way that that works is if somebody says, oh, I'd love to go vegan, but I just don't think I could give up cheese, a great thing to do in response is to say, I understand how you feel. I felt the same way when I was looking into this information for the first time. I thought I wouldn't be able to give up cheese as well. I was a big cheese lover. But what I found is that vegan cheeses are everywhere and there's so many different varieties and different brands that I could get the same textures, the same flavors as the cheese I was eating without involving cows being tortured and being killed. So feel, felt, found is a great way to relate to somebody at their level. Does, there ever, does everybody here not understand that method? Okay, that's good. So it's pretty simple. And that's the other thing. In sales, there's also a saying called KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. So that's the other thing. You need to keep it simple because most people on the streets, especially with the short amount of time that we have them, do not want to get complicated with you. Keep it real simple. And it is really simple. Most people are against stabbing animals in the throat. Great, there's a solution. Eat a veggie burger. It's real simple stuff. So just break it down as simple as possible for people. Even if you're talking to someone who is a scientist on the streets, they probably don't want to get too scientific with you. Um, but if they do, then engage in that kind of technical you know, conversation. But what I'm saying is for the most part, people don't want this. Um, people are simple and that's really all you need to focus on. The other thing I want to focus on is I want you to all understand another thing about sales that the main thing that it comes down to when you're talking to somebody is three things that you need to take people through. There's a journey that you need to take somebody through when you're discussing this issue or discussing anything that you'd like to convince somebody of. And it's a three-part process. The first, and this is 
in order to succeed in a sale, this is exactly how it works. The first part of the discussion is to get them emotionally involved. If you're just talking logic all, logic all day and you're in here all day and you don't get someone to really feel what it is that you're talking about and what it is that you're trying to convince them of, they're not going anywhere. They're not changing, they're not shifting anything. Emotion is so powerful and especially in sales, you need to have somebody emotionally engaged. Especially when you're talking about animals being stabbed to death. You don't want somebody to just be completely without emotion when it comes to this. So that's the first point. Get them to be emotionally engaged. How do you do that? Have you ever seen footage like this before? How does it make you feel? Do you think that this is a problem that should be eradicated from this world? Get them to be emotionally convicted in the conversation. That's the first step. The second step is why that individual should take action as an individual, not just leaving it up to the rest of the world to take action. Why should they take, take action? Once they're emotionally involved and engaged, make it about them and why they should make a difference in the world. How much power they have to make a difference in the world. When you go vegan, according to my calculations, you spare the lives of a thousand animals every year. When you consider all of the victims that are involved in the whole process of meat, dairy, eggs, honey, leather, aquariums, zoos, animals being tested on, I mean, there are so many victims involved. Victims involved. I don't know how some of these other figures have even come about, because according to my research, even 1,000 animals being spared a year is a very conservative number. So that's the power that an individual has when they go vegan, and we're not even talking about activism yet, which should be what we're shooting for when we're having these conversations, not just people going vegan, but also speaking up in whichever way they find effective. So that's the second thing, make it about them and why they should take action as an individual and how they can take action as an individual, as an individual but leave the how part to the end of the conversation and focus on why for the, for the most part of the conversation. How is easy? Why is the hard part? If you can get someone to understand why they should be vegan, they'll figure out how for the most part, trust me. When somebody wants to do something, when they really understand why they should do it, so focus on why for the most part, how at the end. Give them a card like this, you, you've all been given a card, right? This card has it all. Our website is a one-stop shop for anyone who wants to go and stay vegan. It has literally everything to set you up and support you along your journey. So, make it about the individual and why they should take action. The third thing that you do is pretty much what I just said, the how, but the way I'm gonna package this for you is First, get them emotionally engaged. Second, make it about them and why they should take action. Third thing is to, to highlight the benefits for that person. What is the benefit that that individual has for going vegan? Now, we all know that it should be an altruistic act to become vegan because you're doing this for others and you shouldn't be expecting anything in return. But we do know that humans are selfish and we like to know what the benefits are for us. So let's play into that. I know that I went vegan initially because of health reasons. Well, not vegan, but plant-based. And I was someone who took that seriously, so I went down the path of eating right. And that's what led me to watching Gary Rosky's speech because I was already watching plant-based stuff on YouTube. And that's how I went vegan and became a vegan activist. My point is, is that when you focus on the benefits for someone going vegan, at the end of that process, it helps for that person to take it seriously. So if they currently suffer from diabetes, if they're really into their health and they're into the gym, talk about the health benefits. Talk about the environmental benefits for them, their families. If they want to have kids and their kids want to have kids, don't you want a world for them to live in, a healthy world for them to live in? So the environmental benefits. Then also talk about the economic benefit, because we all know that it can be extremely cheap to be vegan in comparison to other diets. If you want to save, uh, if you want to save money on your diet and the budget that you spend on your diet, the cheapest diet on the planet is a vegan diet because you can eat rice, beans, potatoes, greens, bananas, cheapest foods on the planet. You can choose other plant foods that are more expensive, of course, like avocados and blueberries, but you don't have to. If you want to save 
a lot of money, that's the cheapest diet to do it on, is a vegan diet. So there is an economic benefit there. You know, for some people you're speaking to on the streets, there might be students, there might be travelers. Most people are budgeting. They're working within a specific budget. So the economic benefit. And of course, I like to also bring up the most important thing, the benefit of this no longer weighing on your conscience. The benefit of no longer having your hands stained with the blood of animals who are innocent and vulnerable. And that's it. That's the, that's the package. Does everyone not understand that about the process of selling someone on something? So, three-part process. I just wanted to package that for you again. It's getting someone emotionally involved, why it's them that should take action as an individual, and then the benefits for that individual going and doing what it is that you're claiming that they should do. Does that make sense? that if you're doing outreach, we do promote a clear vegan message. So when you're talking to someone, make sure that that is very clear to them. They don't think that we're okay with vegetarian or eating less meat or just cutting out red meat or whatever it is that they think would help. We do like to talk about the animals. We always bring it back to the ethical side of things and we focus on the animals and then we focus on the environment and the health and everything else. But we do promote a clear vegan message. And um, what Brad mentioned before, so sometimes you might be doing outreach and then some, someone's walking past and they're like, thank you for what you're doing, I'm already vegetarian. So if they're, stand, if, you're, if they're stopping, that's a good chance to grab them and explain to them that we're actually not doing the same thing. So explain to them what the difference between vegan and vegetarian is. And, and we usually have footage from egg farms and the dairy industry, so you can talk about those. And also, if you've got a vegan walking past and they're thanking you for what you're doing, it's a great opportunity again to um, let them know that we do these demos regularly and we have 600 chapters around the world So give them a card so they can join us and become active Awesome uh, Just a couple of other things that have come to mind, you know a lot of people well when we get into the objections We'll discuss this further, but a lot of people know that there's only one argument that you can't really argue against and that's that I don't care <laughs> Right but there is actually something that we can say back to that, and that's when did you stop caring? Because then they're going to have to realize that this was taken away from them. Our innocence has been robbed from us. And that's something you might want to remember if somebody says, no, nah, I just don't really care. When did you stop caring? Because when we were kids, we would have been appalled. That's a fact. Uh, so with the outreach, again, um, we do count the tallies, but yes, it is very important that people understand we're not just talking about food here as well, we're talking about the whole gambit. So when, and this is through conversation, you would have to make the person aware that all forms of animal exploitation are wrong, and that's what veganism stands for. <clears throat> um, yeah, I just also want to... Hold that question, hold that thought. Uh, I also wanted to say that uh, with vegetarians, it's a bit different because they already believe that they're on the same side as us, as ours. So when you're talking to a vegetarian, the way that you would approach it is you would say, uh, may I ask why you've gone vegetarian? So you want to focus on the why again. Why did they go vegetarian? Because you'll probably find that it was for an ethical reason. It might be for a health-based reason because it is a diet at the end of the day. But if it is for an ethical reason, then play into why they should be vegan because at the end of the day, vegetarianism is not an ethical position. It's a, it's a diet that excludes meat and that's exactly all it is. So when you're talking to someone who's vegetarian, that's the way that you would approach it. And then, you know, and then most... So you either get one of two things with vegetarians from our experience. One, someone is already so entitled because they believe they're already doing the right thing and how dare you tell them any different. Two, oh my God, I had no idea what happens to dairy, to cows in the dairy industry or what happens to egg in the egg, what happens to chickens in the egg industry. So people who just don't realize that, that they were supposed to be vegan from the beginning, but they just were told something differently. 
they were told that vegetarian is the way to go. So you might have more work in the first instance, you might have more work to do. Uh, you know, some people do feel really entitled, they feel like they're already doing so much for the animals by cutting out meat. You know, so in that instance, you might just, you might want to play it a bit differently where your focus is to educate that person on, on no, there's no, there is no difference in eggs, dairy, or meat. And talking about how all of the dairy cows get sent to the slaughterhouse. All of the, the cows and their babies get turned into meat products. So you might as well be supporting meat products if you're a vegetarian, because quite literally you're paying for it to happen. So that, that would be the approach of someone vegetarian. I just wanted to cover that before I forgot. What was... Yeah, psychology we're trying to address here. If we're just handing out leaflets, we are coming off as very desperate and that's not a good energy to be around. Even though this is the most urgent issue in the world, we don't want to reek of desperation. It's not a good look and it pushes people away. We want to give cards to people who we're engaged with. They either ask us for a card or at the end of the conversation, we feel it's appropriate to offer them one because they're ready to then go and do some homework. Uh, somebody else had a question I asked you to, um, you, I asked you to put that question on hold. Do, do you want to just shoot that question at us? Yeah, it was just about um, when you have a policy on people that are like, physically abusive at, at cubes. Right. Is your, is your policy for that? I mean, yeah, we call the police. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we call the police. But like, but like if, if, I mean, please take time to get there. Okay, well, organizers should be protecting the cubers. The, well, all volunteers, the, the protection of the volunteers is the organizer's responsibility to the extent that we can try to stop what we can try to stop, but we need the police to be there at some point. But if it gets before the to that police level. gets there, the best thing to do is for one of the organizers to, well, you need to stay calm, as calm as you can, talk to that person and try to take them away from the queue so walk with them and get them to walk away from the queue and get someone to call the police. But while you're waiting for the police, it's really important to stay calm and, you know, like Paul said, your job is to protect all volunteers, especially people in the queue because they're wearing the mask holding a screen so they can't really do anything. The best thing to do is to remove that person from that area. Is it worth having a, a policy that can be discussed by the brief before you start the queue, you know, mm -hmm. this is what we're doing in the situation, and stuff like this, because it's come mm -hmm. up a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, this sounds like a training challenge, mm -hmm. and we're working on an academy that we're going to have online that everybody can use from no matter where you are, and it will be a very comprehensive program or course that you will do, and by the end of it, you'll be very proficient in the queue of truth and all of it, all of the nuances that go into it. Yep. You know, I've had a situation where I tried to lead a man away who did not want me anywhere near him. Um, and so then he, he sort of insisted on being with the volunteer. So there's just these little challenges that just knowing how to deal with individual things. Yeah, I think that all of our organisers around the world could use some serious training on dispute management, if that's what you call it. Yeah, like people who are either inebriated, or just aggressive for whatever reason and are a hindrance or a disruption to the event and we need them out of there. So, yeah, we've already recognised that we, that organisers need this kind of training and we're, yeah, we're working on it. Can yes, uh, yeah. Sorry, Don, did you want to add something to that? Uh, I just want to say, just one time we had a guy that just insisted on harassing one of the Cubans and so we had already organised that if this were to happen, then they were to tap each other, elbow each other, and they all put their hands up, everyone in the cube, and so the guy just backed off. And so it was sort of like a, this united front. Um, and, and we found that that worked. So we always sort of had that, got that in the background of your Right. It's just a handy little tip. Yeah, right. <laughs> that it comes up. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, just before we take any more questions, I uh, I just wanted to also 
I'll let everybody know, I'm not sure if we covered this, I just remembered that with doing your tally, so during the demo you're counting your tally, you can actually count your tally on an app that you can download for either iPhones or for Androids, and it's called Clicker. You don't necessarily need this, but it does help, it's called Clicker, and you can just count your numbers that way by just pressing a button and it counts your numbers. So that's a good way of keeping note of how many people in the three or four hours that we're doing these events that you have spoken to have taken the issue seriously. So you can either do that or you can just write it in a note somewhere on your phone and that way you'll have a better recollection of how many people you spoke to that took the issue seriously. Why am I bringing that up? Because it's important that you remember that when you give us your tally it should be as close to, well, like we said, it's conservative. We want to be conservative. But also, you have to give your tally to the organizer before you leave the event. So if you leave early, please give your tally to one of the organizers. So I just wanted to bring that up before I forget. Right, so now we're going to do the objection handling workshop, which I have mentioned. So this is going to be about you throwing your most challenging non-vegan argumentation at me and Asal, and we'll answer them for you. and. If it's not a question, we'll let you know. Because we want to keep this flowing and productive. So please just ask us questions regarding that and we'll keep this flowing until we get that And then at the end we can take questions. Like if you have any other questions about the cube or about tomorrow the event or any other questions, we can take questions at the end as well. That sounds perfect. All right, let's get into it. So plants though, does anyone have that? No. Just whatever you're challenged with, Throw my way. The religious part is always, I get that a lot. Like, God put the animals here for us to use. And they kind of, at that point, a lot of times they just don't want to hear any argument yeah. at all, no matter whether it's like, you know, you get pretty good at it. That's a real common thing. Yeah, uh, we, this came up while doing the workshop for the biggest cube of truth that has ever happened, which happened recently in San Francisco. And we, just before that, we uh, had a bit of a workshop and I, I covered this question. And I said, um, in response to someone saying that God says it's okay, perhaps we can ask the question if God, asked, if God told them that directly. But I think that's perhaps a bit too savage to us to ask the question. So, <laughs> um, I thought it was a fair question at the time, but I realized that it's too savage. So, I think the better question is, does anywhere in the Bible, or let's say you're talking to a Muslim, does anywhere in the Quran mandate meat eating or mandate that you use animals? Because if it's not mandated, then it's unnecessary. It's not necessary. And so we should focus on the necessity. Does God require us to eat animal products? If you're a vegan, will you be cast to hell? Because essentially that's what religious people are claiming, by the way if they are claiming that it's mandated, which it isn't. I just recently got told that for Passover, you're allowed to kill a lamb. You're not allowed. He was saying you have to. You have to, rather. Food. Not allowed. That's, thank you for correcting me on that. So you have to? What does that mean? All vegans will be cast to hell? And I, tried to, I, I wanted to make this clear because if you're going to say that, then you have to also realize what you're implying. You are saying that vegans who are religious will be sent to hell. Whether it's Christian or... And if you're saying that God requires you to kill and eat animals and use animals, that's what you're saying. All vegans are going to hell. And that doesn't even remotely sound true. We want to avoid killing animals and we're going to hell? That can't be right. I think so, a good answer would be that God didn't create those animals. We bred them into existence. That's, that's one point. But then you, that could make an argument for hunting. You could say hunting is justified then. So what I would say is, ask the question, is it mandated, is it required that I eat animal products? You know. And then once you've asked that question, they should come to the conclusion or through the work that you're doing, you should have them reach the conclusion that they don't need to. And obviously the conclusion is that you can be vegan whilst being a Christian or a Muslim or etc. So that's what you want to reach. You want to reach that conclusion of me not needing to. Once you reach that point, then pose the question, if we can live a life healthy and happy without harming animals, why wouldn't we? 
I would also ask the question, don't you think God, who is rooted in peace, compassion, and non-violence, would prefer that we put the knives and guns down and we leave animals to live out their lives with the liberties that they deserve? And to that point, most animals that we breed for food, we breed for food. So they're not breeding on their own terms. We bring them into existence. That could also come up in the conversation, but not as a means to justify it, because you could justify it as a counter with hunting. Does that answer your question? Yes. Good. Yes. Yes. Oh, I was just going to quickly say for that question, I usually just politely remind people that God made animals first. God made animals first. So how did he make them for us to eat if they were here first? He created them before he created us. Yeah, but if you're a Christian, you won't, you don't believe that. Because... Well, you believe in the Garden of Eden and how God created everything in seven days. Yeah. Oh, that's another thing I would talk about, you know, God's most perfect place, heaven, and the Garden of Eden if they're a Christian. But if you just simply talk about heaven, because all religions have this idea of heaven involved in their, in their religions... Would there be a slaughterhouse in heaven? Such a powerful question. And also, too, to add to that, I've um, been dealing with a uh, Christian household, so uh, they always strive for that, you know, to be Jesus-like. So, on top of that, not just if slaughterhouses are in heaven, but if you strive to be Jesus-like every day in your life, why not create that heaven here on earth? Right. Well, I love how Gary Russell says the Garden of Eden. Oops, the Garden of Eden. Because it used to be. That's what it was. There was no killing. We were eating fruit, apparently. Naked, running through the jungles. So, there was no killing. Um, and I would also say, if somebody says God put them here for us, I would also ask, do you think they're here for us or with us? Because that's also another distinction you should draw. That animals are here with us, not for us. And also in that nature, I mean, God or nature is the same thing. Why did they make us uh, not carnivore? I mean, our bodies determine what we should eat, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, every time I tell them we'll, we'll go hunt without a tool yeah. or eat the, the, you know, the meat raw or chicken raw, and nobody has an answer to that either. Because you can't. God didn't make us carnivores, if you think about it. Yeah, totally. But that, so that's another topic of physiology <laughs> and physiology. science where most religious people don't buy it. But I'm just going to keep this to question. So if you're raising your hand right now, please make sure it's a question and not related to the previous one. Yes. Ah, okay. oh, and you? <laughs> uh, all of them came down. Wow. <laughs> all right, yes. Central. Yeah, I, I do like to also say that if God put animals here for us to eat, why would God put animals here with a brain and a central nervous system and a heart and the ability to live in fear and experience torture? That must be a literal hell for them. Why would God create beings only to put them through a literal hell and have them fully experience it? Yes. Yeah, I do. How do you like have any advice for responding to that? Well, there's certain things, there's certain structures within society we've all agreed upon, such as cars and highways. Like we've all agreed collectively as a society that that's a good idea, that we shouldn't just be running to work if we you have to get 20 k's to work. Like cars are a good idea, okay? Um, I wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for planes, and you know. We wouldn't be able to walk here from Australia, that's for sure. So, we've all agreed upon certain things, certain technologies that do cause some harm. And just by existing as humans, we do cause some harm. So the goal is not to be perfect when advocating for this message. Although we do take um, waste seriously within our lives. Um, you know, we try to reduce how much plastic we use and all that kind of stuff. But... What, see, the thing is, if somebody is saying, but you use phones, though, or laptops, though, well, what's the alternative? Do we live in the jungle, and even in that case, we stand on ants and kill them by accident? 
what's the alternative? What is a practical solution to the situation we find ourselves in? Because we didn't ask for this, we were born into this world. So unfortunately I do need to use an iPhone and I need to use an iPhone 10 because the camera is insanely good on it <laughs> to record slaughterhouse footage and to go live at demos because I need to get the message out there and inspire people. So does that answer your question? I hope it kind of does. Yeah. Essentially what I would say to somebody who's positioning us with that is that there are necessary evils in this world that we need to, to accept and then there are things that are completely un unacceptable like choosing cosmetics that are tested on monkeys. We don't need to do that, no matter how good that perfume smells. That's just unnecessary. Yes, next question. Yes, you. I have two questions. One of them is protein, that yes. all men just ask. And the second one is, I think maybe that's what he was referring to, more like, why do you care about animals so much if there's so many, like, you know, Chinese kids in factories? So why don't you care about people instead? Like, that's... Okay, so the first question was protein. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say to like, them, what do you, where do you refer them? Like, so, first you can tell them, well, did you know that you can get your protein from plants? And also I like to say, you know, people like to eat chicken or cow's flesh for protein. And I like to say, where do you think that cow got their protein from? <clears throat> Obviously, you can get it directly from plants. It's really, it, I think this one is really easy for them. Like, people usually don't have anything to say to that. And also, if you want to continue, you can actually show them how there's more protein, for example, in beans mm -hmm. compared to a steak. Mm -hmm. And also, it's got no cholesterol, and you know, so you can just show them facts. And it's more bioavailable. Shout out to Joe Rogan, he's actually in this state, isn't he? I'd love to actually meet that guy. He has no idea what he's talking about when it comes to nutrition. But it is more bioavailable, the protein as well. There's, there's an argument out there that exists that, that protein from beans, for example, is not as bioavailable as the protein in the steak. But it's, the opposite is in fact true. So your other question was... The other question I think you... You meant when people ask you why are you fighting for the animals and not humans, for example, yeah. who are getting killed somewhere or child labor yeah. or anything. So I like to say we as vegans, we try to do our best to avoid exploitation to animals and humans. And I also like to say what's happening to people in Syria, for example, I don't have any parts in that. But if you are eating animal products three times a day, you are contributing to that, so that's very easy for you to avoid. But like Paul was saying, some things we can't avoid. Like we can't for sure know the parts in our mobile phones where exactly they were made. We do our best, we research where we buy our clothing, for example. I'm sure a lot of vegans do, but then there's certain things we can't avoid. So veganism is really about doing our best. I would also ask if they are aware of how much veganism helps humans because as a vegan you are contributing to a much better system that feeds all humans and it's a means to eradicate world hunger when you consider that 50% of the world's crops are put aside and fed to what we call livestock and that food could feed the hungry in this world tenfold, the, the hungry humans that is. You know, so that's another thing. I, and also there's so many human rights injustices in these industries that exploit animals. Do you think anybody in class during school put their hands up and said, I want to be a slaughterhouse worker when I grow up? Yeah. Quite literally nobody has said that. And that's just pointing out how traumatic it must be for the workers as well to work in those places and to become numb, numb to such injustices. And you're doing something about that when you go vegan because you're helping these industries to change and creating jobs for people, you know, like picking broccoli where there's no one screaming in the process and you don't have nightmares at night versus working in slaughterhouses. So you are doing a lot for humans when you go vegan. I haven't even talked about the environmental aspect to this because it creates a better world for all of us, including humans, which we all, we all think we own this earth well, how about we look after it, otherwise we won't be here anymore. So there's the environmental, and also human health 
is at stake here, pardon the pun. I mean, quite literally, it addresses 11 of the 12, or 13 of the 14, I can't remember, most of the chronic diseases that humans are suffering from, and especially addresses the number one chronic disease that people are dying from, which is heart disease. It can reverse heart disease, and is the only diet on the planet that has been shown to reverse and prevent it. You know, so, again, humans are being, are being, what's the word? We, we, are, we are doing this for humans in a massive way. This is for animals, but it benefits humans massively. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool, you've had your hand raised consistently. Yeah, could we do this like role play style? So, like, All right, you go. So you'll be the non-vegan on the street. Yeah. All right, cool. So I hear what you're saying. I care about animals. I love them a lot. Yes. I tried to be vegan, but I have anemia that I can't get all the iron I need. You can't get all the iron you need from plants. Have you? So uh, my friend, immediately I would ask, where do you get your iron from now? <laughs> okay. So, when you get your iron from red meat, do you realize that you're getting it from heme iron? Which is inflammatory? Uh, no, I did not realize that. Okay, so heme, heme iron, heme, heme means heme, hemoglobin, which means blood. Which means you get your iron from the blood of other animals, currently. That is very inflammatory, even if you get it from wild animals. So I would, I would raise that question and maybe draw your attention to that. So I would ask you to look into that. It's not a very good way to get iron. It's like going and getting potassium from Coca-Cola. It's a really bad source of iron. So I would then say, did you know that it's actually more bio, not only more bioavailable, but it's also in higher doses when you get your iron from plants, such as the plants that are growing close to the ground or in the ground. They're the ones that are usually rich in iron. So when you were vegan, were you consuming lots of potatoes, beetroots, dark leafy greens, and mushrooms? No, I was eating a lot of pasta and PB and J. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth, so thank you for being honest with me. <laughs> yeah, so that would be the way I would respond. Was that satisfactory? Yes, thank you. I like how you said which which vegetables have, have iron. Yeah, the ones that grow in or, or close to the ground. They have the most time. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, it's finished, yeah, exactly. Alright, yes. Um, yeah, to keep the role playing going. <laughs> yeah. Hey man, I hear what you're saying, but I can't digest beans. I hate tofu, and miraculously, I also can't eat gluten. <laughs> you know most people have a trifecta of intolerances. It's amazing. <laughs> and they only share that with vegans. <laughs> when they go see the doctor, do you have anything causing any issues with your diet? No. Uh, so, I would say to that person, well, even in that circumstance, you don't necessarily have to eat gluten, and you don't have to eat beans or tofu. There are still a myriad of other plants that you can eat as a vegan. I, in fact, don't even eat those three things very often. So, you can still eat a very, uh, a very comprehensive diet as a vegan. I would also bring up the fact that I'd ask you, did you know that there are 20,000 edible plant species on this planet? So... You know, showing like quite literally how much variety we have. We just need some creativity here. You know, some some thought into recipes and, and um, experiencing different flavors and stuff like that. Um, but if they say I just love eating bread though, or I just need to, you know, for whatever reason eat beans, or if it's a protein thing, like they feel like they're going to be inadequate in some nutrient, then I would just also come back to what I was just saying before about how we can quite easily cover those nutrient deficiencies with a plant-based diet. Does I that think help? any question people have about nutrition and if, if they're concerned about calcium, iron, anything, 
if you explain to them that you can you can have a vegan diet but be unhealthy, you can just basically eat junk food and ice cream all day. Obviously, you're going to be unhealthy, but if you really care about your health, then eating a whole food plant-based diet is the way to go. So eating lots of potatoes, rice, quinoa, and then veggies, like you said, like dark leafy uh, green veggies, and then you know beetroot, beans if they can digest them. So if they are eating a whole food plant-based diet, then they are getting everything they need. But obviously, if they're eating just whatever because it's vegan, then they're gonna have deficiencies. The best thing for a mineral deficiency or vitamin deficiency is a solid green juice. I just recommend that to everyone out there, for bystanders, if you're talking to them. Do you, do you, you know, I would ask, do you have a green juice every day? Because I think everyone should have a green juice every day. Okay, so here's how you address that. Um, first and foremost, most crops in this world fed to animals that people eat. So if he's concerned with crop farming and the practices that go into crop farming, you contribute by far so much more to the injustices occurring in crop farming when you eat animal products because there's so many being used to fed to animals. We should have a discussion about better farming practices. Yeah. Vegans all would not oppose that. Yep. We would have that conversation. I want to have that conversation because I don't like it that pesticides are being sprayed everywhere and end up in our waterways and destroy um, and mess up things for bees and other things. I don't like that. I do want things to, to improve and I do want to buy my produce solely from farmers markets who and from farmers that are doing the right thing. Not the most practical solution for us traveling people at this point in time, but you know, possible it's in many regards. My point is, is that conversation is a real one that we should be having as a whole, but but humans are focusing on 2% of the problem here. Really, the biggest problem is animal agriculture. These industries create far more demand for crop farming than vegans, you know, so that's how I would address that. And people who eat animals, don't just also eat animals, they eat vegetables too. Right. So they're doing both. Yes. They're doing double, so that yeah. doesn't make any sense. Again, and veganism is not something that anybody does to become a perfect human being. That's not what the definition of veganism is. The definition is to avoid animal exploitation as much as practicable and possible. So this is about being practical. You know. So yes, there are some animals that are killed in crop farming and the farmers might go and kill, in Australia they kill kangaroos and you know, you're paying for that when you buy your organic grapes. I get that. You're supporting that. But it's not a perfect system. At least you're not overtly creating the, the demand for cow flesh. Which you can argue... See, there's, there's certain things that you can argue with crop farming. You could argue that you don't know whether an animal has been harmed in the process of the broccoli getting there to your plate. You don't know. It may have happened. It may not have happened. But when you order cow flesh, there's no gray area. It's a fact that an animal was murdered for this. So that's what vegans are trying to do here. Vegans are trying to just avoid the obvious exploitation that's at hand here. And even vegans, like, we're always learning more and more and more about how exploitation of animals ends up in insidious ways in products and services and things. So we, it's a constant learning process, but of course we're going to do this because we put ourselves in the victim's position. Like you said, it's easy to make the right decision when you're thinking about this ethically. You know, sure, I'll just take the B12 supplement and avoid killing a cow in the process. For you, it's a no-brainer. You know, and that's how it should be. Unethical things happening in like one environment does not constitute... Um, yeah. Well, when you try to tell people that are posing, they're going to find any... Like, especially, like, I think he's been my hardest you know, person to convince or to even touch anywhere. And that's the thing is like, it's the thing where I hear a lot of things about, well, if you love animals, you wouldn't do this. Well, he loves animals and has pets. But he doesn't make that connection. And, and I, I sometimes feel that you hear that a lot, like if you love animals, you wouldn't do that. 
But I've also seen videos where I've had people in my home and it kind of happens, like a constant, you know, um, vegan and animal rights stuff going on, which would be with my kids. And, and the question that people come at me, you know, the, the things that they, I see people don't connect. So there is a lack of compassion. There is, and, and I guess like you were saying, when you come to, when you just can't waste your time, I'm not gonna waste my time with him anymore because there's other people that I can, I can reach. But it's been put out there to him, I gave him the information. But I just, I'm finding that the compassion, there's so many people, they just lack it. Even though you would think showing them these videos and would touch something, I mean, people walking by, it doesn't move them at all. And that, that, I don't understand that because well, I, I had the same response when I first saw footage like that. It's not that we lack compassion. I don't think that people here went vegan because of compassionate reasons. I, I, I hear this a lot in the vegan movement, and I don't agree that you go vegan out of compassion. I think you go vegan because it's the right thing to do, and you see it as, a, as an issue of justice and fairness. Because... If I don't stab a human to death today, that doesn't make me compassionate by default. Mm -hmm. If I don't stab an animal to death, it doesn't make me compassionate. Does that make sense to you? So avoiding killing animals doesn't make you compassionate. It's just the right thing to do. You wouldn't do it in your right mind. You wouldn't walk out of your house with a knife in your hand seeking to kill innocent animals needlessly. Nobody in their right mind would do that. So it's just a matter of Veganism shouldn't even be a thing. There should be no word for it because there's no word for people who don't kill humans or commit injustices against humans. We're just normal people who don't get a label. But if you rape and murder other humans, you get a label. Rapist, murderer. Does that make sense? It's because we think we're natural meat eaters. That's why. Before we get educated on our biology. Yeah. That we're not. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not that it's generally not that people aren't. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that back to that point because I just want to say that we're all conditioned into this psychopathy. So I just I'll repeat that we're all conditioned into this psychopathy. Our compassion, quote unquote, has been robbed from us. We do evil things and commit violent acts towards animals. And we pay for it time and time again to happen multiple times a day on on our behalf. Because, because we don't see it as an injustice. We don't even consider animals victims at all. And that's the thing, when we say, think about it from the victim's point of view, and people say, victim, they never even consider that animals are victims. So that's, that's the work that I think humans need to do. And I find it really crazy that humans haven't already had like a serious conversation amongst themselves about whether we are carnivores, omnivores, or herbivores, because it seems to me that it would be quite important to figure that out, because we're talking about life and death here. Exactly. We're talking about literally killing animals as a result of that conclusion, whether we are meat eaters or not. I mean, that's a very serious thing that we should have established by now, but clearly we haven't. So I don't know if that answers to your question, does it? All right, cool. Um, someone over there has had their arm up. I can't see who, because it's blurry from the light. But you, yes, you. Sophia. Sophia. Oh. Um, I talk to like a lot of people from a young generation. So they always say like they want to be vegan, but their family would never let them. Like, what would you say to that? So if somebody wants to go vegan but their family won't let them, it's about you empowering them as much as you can with, again, playing into the why factor. So have, having them convicted and sold on why they should be, on why they should be vegan. Then giving them resources so that they can work out how to be vegan on their own accord and slowly start to educate themselves so that when they break free from their enslavement and from their parents, they can then become vegan and do what they want. So, you know, giving them the tools and the resources like the ones we have on our website. But first I would focus on making sure they get why they should be vegan and really feeling the conviction. Does that help? I say to kids, don't listen to your parents if they try to tell you that you need to eat animal <laughs> products. You, you know, you can be kind to, you can, you, you know that when you eat animal products it hurts animals, you don't have to do that. Look at us, we're thriving as vegans. Do you know what vegan means? And you know, like this is what I, 
what I would say to the kids. Like, try to empower them so they don't have to just listen to their parents when they're saying that you need to eat meat and you need... Because I find that to be one of the most horrendous things that we do, that we force feed children an injustice and force them to take part. So, next question, please. Yes. Yeah, so the first Cuba trip I ever attended, uh, this lady walked right up to me and asked me what my stance was on abortion. Uh, oh, my God. Next question. I that matter. Yeah, it was my first cube. So I was pretty nervous. Uh, I did tell her I was pro choice, and she immediately asked me, like, if you don't respect the right of a child to be born, why should I respect that animal right to and I haven't had a chance to come up against that question again. I, 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 I know how I would respond. How would you? Uh, so I was asked, well, she was saying that, uh, well, at the time I said that these are two different issues, like they're not related, but she was saying, no, we're talking about life and death, life and death. So now I would say, you know what, there is a connection between what you think about abortion and animal rights. Uh, it's about choice of the individual. Uh, you know, the woman is the one harboring the child, so she, and she has one life, she has, she's gonna live with the consequences. It's not gonna be easy if you choose to abort, you're gonna live with that the rest of your life. It's probably the hardest decision any woman ever has to make. Yeah. The, only, the thing is, uh, that's them making a choice for themselves, but when you decide to eat animals, you're making a choice for another individual. And the animals don't give consent exactly. at all. They don't have a choice in this, so. Well, you should come to fight for prevention, you know? Right, and I, and I, and I would tell them that if you really want women not to get an abortion, you should really support programs that support single mothers, teach them how to raise a child, give them help to get through education so they want to have a child, mm -hmm. instead of, because right now in America, it's, you know, there's a stigma for single mothers, they call divorce, slut, you know, why did you have a kid, where's the dad? Um, so like, who would want to have a kid if that's what they're getting themselves into? Mm -hmm. It's going to be harder for them to finish education and everything. Someone actually recently asked us, as an organization, if we have a stance on abortion. And our response, our official response was, we're an animal rights organization and we don't feel that it's necessary for us to have a stance on it. So we're all gonna have our individual opinions on it, obviously. But if someone approaches you, they're really just trying to divert the conversation and they don't wanna talk about the animals. Because like I was saying before, when you're paying someone to kill animals so you can eat them, you're actually participating in that. But my opinion of, of abortion, when I have never experienced it myself, it's not relevant. So really, I feel like people who keep talking about these things at events, they really just wanna, just wanna argue with you. In my experience, people who have brought up abortion they were not open to discussing. Yes. That's just my opinion, my experience, but they were just not open to talking about animals and they, they were just not open to the arguments and to veganism. They're just there because they see that we're doing something and it offends them that there is a cause that's just 100% dedicated to animals and they want to make it about humans. They just don't like that. Uh, the person that he gets that question a lot and I've seen on his interviews and he always tells them you're more than welcome to go and fight for your cause yeah. but this one you don't have to participate so you can part, you, you can basically uh, care for mul multiple causes yeah. and I feel like that, that's a very good answer it exactly. is because when you go vegan it's a non-action does everyone know what that means? so when you're not vegan you're doing something but you're doing something that's wrong we shouldn't have been doing it in the first place when you go vegan you stop doing that thing. It's a non-action. You're not doing anything now. You're just eating plants. <laughs> when, you, when you become an activist, you're now doing something, but now you're doing something that's righteous. You're doing something like speaking up against the injustices that you were committing unknowingly. So, when you're vegan, not taking action, not doing anything. Therefore, if it's a non-action, you can still be an activist in other regards while eating a veggie burger instead of a chicken burger. What would be your response when you said that you're an animal rights organization and someone said humans are animals? Wow. Yeah, but I usually say, because people are fighting for all different causes, right? 
they, they hold margins for racism, for example, or anything that involves humans. Nobody ever, no vegan activist ever goes up to them and asks them to talk about animals and speak up for the animals. I don't know anyone who has ever done that. I don't know why we're expected to involve humans in this one cause that animals have. Yeah, I mean, for every single vegan we've had come up to us and say we need to speak more about other issues pertaining to humans, I, I just, yeah, I just, I wonder, like, when we're going to see the day when one vegan goes up to a Black Lives Matter event and demands that they have vegan literature at their events. I just, it's never going to happen, but... Vegans seem to be targeted the most when we're speaking up for animals. It's not right. Yeah. Uh, you've had your hand up, so... Um, I was wondering, what would you say to someone who, although you go to McDonald's and get like a $2 hamburger, what would you say to them to say, hey, you should bring it back to the animals again? Because veganism is not about what is cheaper, really. It's just about not harming animals. So you can bring it back to the animals and say that two dollar burger involves a victim, but a bowl of rice and veggies doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, someone said they can go to Taco Bell because two dollars will get you some tacos at Taco Bell. You know what I mean? But yeah, again, like I said, this is more of a why thing than it is a how thing. That's that person sounds like they need to be convinced on why they should be vegan because then they'll understand that that two dollars, that convenience, that economic um, the savings that they make economically doesn't justify the action. We do want to talk about the benefits of being a vegan like it's better for your health, it's better for the environment, it might be cheaper in many cases but we do always want to bring it back to the animals because yeah. that's what veganism is. Yes. What about somebody who was like an ex vegan? Like somebody who says, Oh, I got sick, or like, mm -hmm. there's a bunch of excuses. But I've had people come up to me and say, I used to be vegan. What's the best way to approach that? There's no such thing. So as soon as someone says that, they were you, know, you know that they were doing it for health reasons. Or, or maybe initially they, was, they were stimulated by something they had seen about animal cruelty but they don't really know the full extent of what goes on in animal agriculture or the whole gambit of animal exploitation so it just sounds like that person still needs to be educated on why they need to be vegan so um, what about like how to segue into a conversation with that right so they so they come up and say hi i, I used like i used to be vegan but yeah it was hard so what would they in this case so, so we covered that before when, uh, yes, I've forgotten your name, but you covered um, the whole thing. We're talking about nutrition. Yeah, calcium and iron. So, yes, you. Anybody else? Questions? I thought you had your hand up. That was for the way up. Yes. Yeah, so I, I hear what you're saying. Like, I think animal cruelty is horrible and I'm completely against it, so can I be pescatarian? <laughs> well, when you're pescatarian, you're still committing harm to, act to marine animals. Yeah, but they're fish. Yeah, and fish feel pain, they're not vegetables. So, so I'll explain to you what it's like to be killed as a fish if, let's say, the most sustainable and most humane fishing methods, which would be just one person in a fishing line, Let's say in that circumstance you catch a fish. This is what it would be like. You're walking through the park and you're hungry. You see a mango tree. You grab a mango. As soon as you, your hand touches the mango, something wraps around your hand and pulls you up into the atmosphere and outside into space. And you can no longer breathe. You're pulled, you've been pulled so far out of your habitat that you're alone and isolated and have no idea what's happening. And then you, you die because you can't breathe anymore. That's quite literally what we do to fish when we kill them. And from the victim's point of view, we can't justify that. So if you agree that animal cruelty is wrong, fish are animals and they don't deserve the wrath that we put them through. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Does that help? That, that, that does help, and, and I kind of see that, but it's like, you know, I don't, I don't feel it. Like, you know, when I see, like, the cruelty, like, um, that, like, chickens go through or whatever, like, I mean, I can see that, but when it's a fish, I'm just like, you know, I hear what you're saying, but you just, like, I just feel like I don't really care. Sure. When did you stop caring? <laughs> because if you were a kid, when you were a kid, I can guarantee you if I had a fish in front of you and I stabbed that fish to death, you'd run off crying. Or you wouldn't like it. You wouldn't like it. Especially if the fish was flapping everywhere, blood was going everywhere. You just wouldn't like that. I can guarantee you. So... We may not be able to relate to fish because they swim in water and we walk on land, they have scales and we have skin, but they're the same as us in all of the ways that matter. In fact, fish feel more pain than we do because we have the ability to shut off pain receptors when we have an accident. If you fall and smash your knee on the ground today, you won't feel it as much as you'll feel it tomorrow. You'll feel it tomorrow for sure. But in the moment, your brain cuts off pain receptors. It's a matter of surviving. Your body has this ability. Many fish do not have that ability. They feel everything. So they feel more than us. They're also incredibly intelligent, even though the morality of killing animals shouldn't boil down to intelligence. But they're so much more intelligent than we give them credit for. And I think that's at least worth noting. So, yes? How would you address the intelligence issue? From what angle? Animals aren't intelligent. I would say, do you think that intelligence justifies murder? If I'm more intelligent than you, does that justify me harming you? Do, do then children born with mental challenges deserve to be murdered? Or does it justify us murdering them if we get some kind of benefit out of it? Of course not. Does that help? <laughs> why are we anthropomorphizing animals? Why are we comparing animals to humans if they're not the same? Because when you analyze any injustice, you must analyze it from the victim's point of view. So we ask ourselves the question, would we be okay with that if we were in their position? I don't think that's anthropomorphizing. I think that's just... That's just how you should analyze all injustices from the victim's point of view. Yes. All right, we've got eight minutes exactly. Somebody else had a question? Uh, Dom? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, That's okay. How do you deal with uh, someone that comes from a place of knowledge? Teachers, scientists, doctors. Yep. Um, they're not as intelligent as us. They spend many, many years studying. Mm -hmm. Well, if they're being intellectually honest and open-minded with you, then it's actually a really good opportunity for you to get into some of the facts I've been sharing today. Maybe you want to tell them how many animals are killed every year, how much crop land is being used to feed those animals, how animal products are leading to most of our chronic diseases, how the industries are lying to us about what is humane, grass-fed and organic, how all animals experience a tremendous amount of torture and live in hell before we murder them and eat them, how it's completely unnecessary and how vegans are changing the world. We, all these things that we could talk about to an educated person would actually be more well received than it would somebody who doesn't know anything about how much. Often is the cherry picking situation as well, you know, when it comes to the calves, if they, if they feel so strongly and adamantly about what they have learnt and you're trying to teach them to unlearn that, they, they will use often, you know, this idea of cherry picking. So cherry picking is what people do when, uh, I like the way that Bill Burr puts this, when you're when people go online and they go into imright.com <laughs> and they're just trying to like find things to justify their position and that's what cherry picking is. But again, this comes down to whether that person is being intellectually honest and open with you. And if they're not, then this might be a matter of you just saying what you need to say, leaving them with a card and cutting the conversation off there. But if it's someone educated, um, I'll use this opportunity actually to play into what we should be doing is mirroring people. You wouldn't talk to a truck driver the same way you talk to a 
a esteemed corporate exec. The conversation is going to be a bit different, so try to mirror the person you're talking to. If you're talking to younger kids, their caps are backwards, their pants are sagging, loosen up a bit. Don't be so, you know, like, you know, maybe you can be a bit more casual with those people when you're talking to them, because they'll relate better. And if you're talking to someone who is a professor in agriculture, then it might be a good idea to just stick to the facts and keep it rational. But don't discredit what I said before about the sales process, because that's how it works for everybody, no matter what field you work in or what category of human you fit into. Quite literally, everybody goes through the same process. Emotion, you get them emotionally involved, then you make it about that individual, why that person should make change, and the benefits for that individual, why they should make change. All right, so I think we're gonna to have to wrap this up. So thank you all for being here and being a part of this. This was productive and fun.